the Biden administration will present different kinds of challenges, but that we'll be probably talking about that in next year's year ahead once we figured out the patterns and rhythms of that administration. So uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce uh, our, our speakers uh, for the first panel. And let me just get that on my screen so I don't mess up the introduction. Uh, so uh, we're going to have uh, three speakers, and then we're going to have uh, questions from me, and then questions from the audience. You should be able to take a look at the the box on the screen and hit the little hand raise symbol to participate, which means that you can then email us a message, uh, a question, and hopefully I'll figure out by the time they start arriving how I get to read them. And I will then ask some of them to our panelists. Um, our first speaker today is Roland Paris. Uh, Roland is a professor of public and international affairs at the University of Ottawa. Uh, he holds a PhD from Yale University and he has uh, been working in, in and out of government over the course of his career. He was most recently the def, uh, defense and senior defense senior advisor to the prime minister from 2015 to 2016. His research focuses on, focuses on international security, peace building, and foreign policy. Don Murphy, uh, who will be the second speaker, uh, she is uh, uh, got a PhD from George Washington University, and she is an assistant professor at, of international stud security studies at the Air War College, the American, the U.S. Air War College. She held a, a postdoctorate research fellow with uh, Princeton, Harvard, China, in the World Program at Princeton University, and she focuses on Chinese foreign and domestic policy and international relations. Our third speaker, Cesar Jeremillo, is. Uh, the executive director of the Project Plowshares. He holds an MA in global governance from the University of Waterloo. He previously held a, a fellowship at the Center for International Global Governance Innovation. That's CG. Uh, he is an international civil society representative. He's spoken to the UN General Assembly and to the UN Gen Conference on Disarmament. Um, uh, we have their bios up on the website at w.ccids.ca slash year ahead uh, 2021 agenda. Uh, the, Roland will be going first and his talk's title is Responding to the China Challenge. Roland. Thanks, Steve. It's, real, um, it's a real pleasure to participate in this conference. Uh, and there is so much uh, to talk about in relation to China, but um, my charge was to answer the question what should Canada do about China, uh, which is itself uh, a difficult one. But to summarize what I'm going to say over the next few minutes, uh, we need to help the new Biden administration assemble a working coalition of allies and partners to push back against China's more aggressive practices, while also seeking to cooperate with China in areas of mutual interest. Now, the good news for Canada is that uh, there's a prospect of a collective approach on China uh, that seemed virtually impossible during the Trump administration, not least because he sometimes treated his allies uh, worse than his adversaries. And it has been a rude shock for Canadians to suddenly feel so alone and exposed, or worse, to feel like roadkill in a great power game of chicken. Our ability to push back against uh, China, uh, Canada's ability to push back against China, uh, depends on working alongside allies. We alone cannot outmuscle China in a bilateral battle of wills. Although there are some people in this country who've been calling for all manner of retaliation against Beijing for the detention of Michael Spavor, Michael Kovrig, and I have certainly shared their frustration, we are not a great power that can single-handedly bend China to our will. And that's why the imminent change of U.S. administration is so important and so welcome. This week, Thomas Friedman of the New York Times asked Biden how he planned to deal with China. And his answer was music to the ears of government leaders in this city and in many other capitals. He said, quote, the best 
China strategy is one which gets every one of our allies on the same page. It's going to be a major priority for me in the opening weeks of my presidency to try to get us back on the same page with our allies. So Biden seems to, almost certainly does, based on his history, understand in a way that Trump never has, that America's strength also lies in working with allies and in building a common agenda that establishes clear limits on the kind of behavior that we'll accept from China and then actually upholds those limits. Now, none of this is going to be easy, but over the last few years, there's been growing concern in many countries about China's more assertive, if not aggressive, behavior. <clears throat> We've seen China's coercive diplomacy firsthand in this country, but we're not alone. Uh, not only does China arrest people as de facto hostages in diplomatic disputes, <clears throat> but it also has a practice of using trade as a weapon to punish countries that displease Beijing, as Australia is now experiencing in spades. There's also growing evidence of Chinese activities aimed at manipulating and sometimes threatening members of diaspora Chinese communities, including in Canada. Some of China's economic practices have also raised concerns, including its reportedly extensive theft of intellectual property, its use of state-owned enterprises as instruments of geopolitical influence, and its history of requiring foreign companies operating in China to share their trade secrets. And there's no question that China is seeking to dominate emerging technologies that will be the drivers of future economic growth, and which in many cases have military applications as well. We've also witnessed the growing repressiveness of the Chinese state at home, including the forced incarceration of hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs in conditions that, to put it mildly, are grossly inhumane, as well as China's recent moves to eliminate Hong Kong's legal status guaranteed under a treaty with the United Kingdom. Now, some of these practices have been around for a while, but many of them have intensified recently or are new. And they have prompted a remarkably fast shift in attitudes towards China in the United States, in Europe, and in this country, and of course, in China's neighborhood. Still, there are differences among democracies in how they view China. In general terms, there's a tendency in Washington to view China as an adversary, whereas in Europe, uh, many Europeans are more inclined to regard China as a strategic competitor. And naturally, since the United States has defense treaties with a number of Asian countries and a longstanding strategic interest in the region, there's less appetite in Europe to devote resources to containing China's military power. So Biden will have to negotiate a compromise if he wants a common front. And that's where Canada can help. Serving as a kind of bridge between the United States and Europe is a very traditional Canadian role, and it very much serves our interests to do so. So what might be the elements of such a compromise, the main parts of a shared agenda? Well, as it happens, earlier this week, the European Union made an opening bid weeks uh, before the Biden inauguration. The EU proposed the creation of a transatlantic trade and technology council to, to do, among other things, to set joint standards on critical and emerging technologies, which in practice would be meant to prevent China from establishing economic dominance across a number of high value sectors and strategically important technologies. Think 5G networks, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, advanced robotics, internet standards, semiconductors. The EU also proposed closer cooperation on investment screening, on intellectual property rights, and on forced transfers of technology and export controls. Now, establishing a common front just on these items would be a real step forward. And it would also be a basis for doing more, because what we need is to restore a unity of purpose, to repair trust, and to rebuild 
the resolve to push back against China on a range of issues. But we also have to do that in a smart way. Some people seem almost eager to embark on a new Cold War with China, which I don't think is either inevitable or wise. Because treating China as if it is a full spectrum enemy could very well turn it into one. That's why it's important to be clear about the specific Chinese behaviors we won't accept and to uphold those limits firmly and collectively while at the same time maintaining channels of communication with Beijing and seeking to cooperate in areas that require cooperation. We need to cooperate with China on climate change, on the stability of the global financial system, and dealing with the, the, the cumulative debt effects of massive COVID stimulus in so many countries. And of course, we need to be uh, cooperating on pandemic preparedness and response. We absolutely need to fix the system so we don't see a repeat of the totally inadequate re early response to COVID-19. And we should be seeking to cooperate with China on nuclear non-proliferation and on conventional arms control and on devising rules and limits on the use of new kinds of weapons like offensive cyber tools. In short, we need to demonstrate both greater resolve and a measure of restraint. And that's not an easy policy to manage, but we have no choice because managing relations with China is going to be an enormous foreign policy challenge for the community of democracies for many years, if not decades, decades to come. And Canada can advocate for such an approach. Perhaps the most effective way to do so is by trying to facilitate agreement between the new US administration and our other principal allies on a common agenda. Because there is strength in numbers and strength in common cause and Canada needs both. Thank you. What a great start to the conference today, Roland. That really set things out very nicely for us. Uh, now our Second panelist is Don Murphy. She'll be speaking on current trends in China's international relations. Don. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much for having me here today. Um, first, I do want to give my disclaimer that today my comments do not represent the views of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, or the Air Force. Everything I say today during the presentation and the Q&A is my own assessment. And what I want to do today, I'm not an expert on China-Canada relations. My work more looks at China's international relations, China's relations with the developing world, and China's relations with the international order. And so I want to make some broad comments regarding trends in China's relations with the world um, as a basis for discussion in the Q&A. So first, if you think about Belt and Road back in 2013, when it was originally announced as a land belt and a maritime road, China since that point has increasingly been articulating its vision of its role in the world, very much with the focus on connectivity in the areas of infrastructure, trade, finance, policy, people-to-people -people relations, you know, many different aspects of relations with the rest of the world. And it's leveraging all of its instruments of power in pursuing its foreign policy objectives through Belt and Road and other foreign policy initiatives. Another characteristic of China's current international relations is that it has more of an omnidirectional focus. So if you think about going back to 2012 or so, increasingly Chinese scholars started to articulate a need for China not just to look to the East, to look to Asia Pacific, but increasingly to look to the West, uh, to Central Asia and onwards towards Europe um, to facilitate China's growth as a Eurasian power. And in order to hedge in the, the um, in case you had conflicts in Asia Pacific with its um, you know, various partners in that region, as well as the US. So you start to see this more omnidirectional focused on both East and West. Another characteristic of China's current international relations is that it's been building 
parallel regional organizations throughout the international system. And this started all the way back in 2000. But for example, it's built cooperation forums, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which focuses on Central Asia. There's one for China Arab States cooperation, cooperation with Africa, the 17 plus one for Central Europe, the Caribbean, China and Portuguese speaking, speaking countries. Basically, if you look at most of the developing world, China has established these cooperation forums. And these organizations give them the opportunity to link economic, political, and, and security issues in managing their multilateral relations with these regions. The norms that form the core of these organizations that China is establishing are the five principles of peaceful coexistence, which have a heavy emphasis on a strict interpretation of Westphalian sovereignty, focused on territorial integrity, as well as non-interference. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on South-South cooperation between countries in the developing world and China. And in the economic sphere, there's much more of a norm of a role for the state in the economy broadly. Recently, as I'm sure many of you are aware, in addition to these, these parallel orgs, and there's many different institutions that China is establishing, but some other high profile examples recently would be China ratifying the um, RCEP, so the regional, um, the regional cooperative economic partnership in Asia, as well as China entering a free trade agreement with um, Africa as a continent. One thing I do wanna highlight about th these different organizations, and this is something that we don't in the US look at, at as much, but I think it's important to think about how China's portraying itself as a great power to the developing world and to the, the globe more broadly. And what China is emphasizing through these organizations is that it's a defender of sovereignty, an advocate for development, a balanced player on the international stage, willing to work with all countries and all regime types globally to address issues of peace and security. It, in general, has a focus on multilateralism, um, connectivity, as I already mentioned, and it increasingly emphasizes that it does not have the colonial past that many Western powers do in the developing world. And I would say through these organizations, it's increasingly becoming sophisticated in how it responds to concerns. So for example, as you have pushback about debt diplomacy or about the, the negative consequences of China's role in Africa, in the developing world more broadly, I think China, both from a state standpoint, but also through its state of enterprises, is attempting to address some of those concerns and alleviate those concerns. The next aspect of China's current international relations that I wanna highlight is its increased assertiveness. And Roland already brought this up, but I really think it's important to think about how China's been assertive with threats both within China as well as without. So again, Xinjiang was already mentioned, in addition to all of the gross human rights violations that are occurring there, China increasingly has been pressuring Muslim countries in particular around the world to support its um, behavior or at a minimum to stay silent with their objections regarding its behavior in Xinjiang. Hong Kong with the new national security law and other reactions to protests there is another example. Taiwan, you you've seen increased assertiveness. You know, we can have a discussion regarding what's the root cause of that and what is the U.S.'s role in that increased assertiveness, but there has been an increase there, as well as the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and over the last couple of years, even territorial disputes with India. So overall, you know, since the, the early 2010s, you've had this increased assertiveness, but as Roland stated, over the last year or so, you're, you're definitely seeing an uptick in this in various ways and for various reasons. Next, um, Roland also mentioned this, but China since 2010 increasingly is using economic, economic punishment and coercion towards it, its partners in order to achieve political goals. Some high pro profile examples of that would be um, Japan, the dispute with Japan in 2010, where there was a halt in the export of rare earth minerals. The Philippines in relation to conflicts associated with the South China Sea. You've had economic coercion used towards Korea in response to THAAD, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System. And as Roland mentioned, Australia, um, obviously this, this last week, you've got over a 200% tariff on wine, but over the last few um, months, you've had a number of 
products tariffed and, and over the last few years as well. So you're seeing this, and these are just a few high profile examples, but I think it's important because all the way up till 2010, you didn't see as much of this economic coercion, but clearly it has become a major characteristic of its approach to the international system. Next, you've got an increased um, focus on nationalism. And again, this goes back into the 2000s. It's not brand new. But I would say um, with the trade war with the US during that time frame, you've seen, seen increasing nationalism um, both towards the, the US, towards Japan, towards other kind of historical um, adversaries that we can talk about that more in Q&A, but I think that's something that, especially with COVID and with the U.S. response to COVID, we may see even more increased nationalism from China. And related to that, China has had more of a focus on self-reliance. And again, this goes back to 2011 or so when they started to emphasize more indigenous innovation. And then you had the Made in China 2025 initiative with China, you know, working towards having a leading role in certain industries. But during the trade war, I think there were some important points for the PRC in thinking through its self-reliance. And one of the most important was with ZTE, the major telecommunications company, that when the U.S. put restrictions, export restrictions on components going to ZTE and quickly over the course of a month shut down a major Chinese telecommunications company that had seven, I'm sorry, 75,000 employees that lost their jobs as a result of that. I think you both had Chinese leadership as well as the Chinese public start thinking more and more about the degree to which China needs to be self-reliant, at least from the US, if not from the international system and in these very key high technology areas. Um, another example of this on self-reliance is if you look at the most recent reporting on the upcoming five-year plan, there is more of this focus on domestic consumption and on indigenous innovation of various technologies and um, industries that have a national security emphasis. And next, you have an infringement by China on free speech and, and human rights more broadly, increasingly outside of its own borders. There's been some high profile examples, you know, Hong Kong obviously is one. Um, but you've had China trying to pressure Cambridge University Press for it to, you know, not publish certain um, content. You've seen this type of behavior towards presses in Australia as well. There are many other examples, but I would say over the last several years, you've always had the issue of China restricting human rights in its own borders, but you're starting to see that bleed out into the inter international system more. Finally, I do want to highlight that during COVID, especially um, China's health diplomacy, and this is something there's a very long history going back to the 1960s of China being engaged in health diplomacy and providing assistance to the developing world in particular in manufacturing drugs and, and having doctors go into that regions, you know, into those regions and providing training. But during COVID-19, you have had China, although it's been criticized for the quality of some of the personal protective equipment you know, or some of China's behavior associated with it. It has been out in the developing world, providing PPE, sending doctors, providing, you know, various levels of expertise. And on the vaccine front, it's been working with a number of countries, including the UAE, um, to test and then start to actually utilize um, vaccines that are in development. And so after COVID on the, this health diplomacy, I think in the West, there's a lot of focus on, as I said before, the defective PPE or China using this as a as leverage. But I think it's going to take a long time to see what the actual outcome of this is for China. Because on one hand, although there's a lot of blame um, that you know, that they can take for the mishandling of the origins of this actual pandemic, they fairly quickly have controlled it within their own borders, although they were using various you know, draconian methods to do that. But they've got it relatively under control within their own borders, and they are increasingly trying to help other countries to address their issues um, with it. So I think time will tell how they come out of this and how they're perceived as a great power in relation to this global crisis. So today, I, I've tried to point out a few trends, including Belt and Road, China's omnidirectional uh, approach focusing on both this East and its West, China establishing parallel organizations, its increased assertiveness, economic punishment, nationalism, self-reliance, infringement on human rights, 
And then finally, it's COVID and, and public health diplomacy. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Don. That was terrific. Uh, next, we have uh, Cesar Germello uh, speaking on diplomatic posturing or genuine multilateralism, what to make of China joining the arms trade treaty. Cesar. Yes, uh, thank you, Steve, and thank you very much to the network for, for having me here. We're at Project Closure. We're proud members of the Canadian Defense and Security Network, and thanks very much to Roland and Don for the excellent and very insightful uh, presentations. So my remarks are about a very particular case study. As of October of this year, so less than two months ago, China is now a state party to the Arms Trade Treaty, which is, you know, it, it's the, your classic multilateral treaty regime. And it, it, when it joined the Arms Trade Treaty, it raised a number of eyebrows. And we're, we were not surprised to see that, that China joined the Arms Trade Treaty raised uh, some eyebrows. So the question I'm trying to address here, or, or I hope we can address collectively a little bit, is should this be welcomed? No, should Canada welcome China joining the, uh, uh, the Arms Trade Treaty? Should the international community welcome uh, China joining? joining the arms trade treaty and uh, I'll, I'll give you the answer you know from my perspective from project Plowshare's perspective and we're also part of this international coalition that monitors the arms trade the global arms trade and and the answer is yes with a bunch of caveats but the answer is yes it's better to have them in this regime than outside of this regime among other reasons because we know them to be a major arms exporter so in my brief remarks i'll, I'll focus on three general areas first i'll, I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about the, the context for the global arms trade uh, just to, to situate the conversation second the context for china's role in the global arms trade and thirdly and last some of the reactions that i've noticed in the in the, in, the, in the sort of in the in the arms trade circuits and, and, and circles, excuse me. So the global arms trade, first uh, to start, uh, depending on whom you ask, it, 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 it's valued at anywhere from 70 billion to more than $200 billion a year. And the reason why there isn't a concrete, uh, a very precise figure around it is because one of the characteristics of the global arms trade has been the lack of transparency. And I'm just, uh, no, I'm not talking just about China, just in general, this is a very, this, this tends to be a very obscure uh, regime. Now, the lack of transparency doesn't make it bad business. I mean, from a, just from a sheer lucrative perspective, this is very good business. You know, there's, there's a constant demand for arms and ammunition, and apparently there's a constant supply of arms and ammunitions, and there's, a, there's no shortage of ma arms manufacturers willing to supply those arms to those who have deep pockets and those who need them. Now, we are not at Project Plowshares pacifists at all. We recognize that there is a, a licit uh, um, trade in conventional arms around the world and that, that it, it is legitimate business in many cases. But we're also keenly aware that a good chunk, a good proportion of this global arms trade, in fact, goes to enable the violation of human rights, to exacerbate armed conflict, to sustain autocratic regimes. And that is the part that concerns us and uh, in general, and, and this is something that also applies very keenly to China. In previous years, if you had a look at the at list of the top 10, top 20 arms exporters in the world, normally China would not make the cut. But it wasn't because it wasn't an active uh, player in the arms industry, but because the lack of transparency was especially apparent in the case of China. It is a very opaque system, and researchers from, from various, from civil society, from academia, have been, you know, doing some forensic analysis and piecing together what little information there is. But now there is widespread agreement that if you if you if you if you looked at the at the top 10 arms exporters china would be roughly number five just after the us russia uh france and germany so number five so this is a very you, you know a, a very a very important place in the global arm, arms industry but we perhaps are are hardly taking notice of the uh, of this and it's also a relatively new development the fact that it is more qualitatively and quantitatively tracked you know the extent of china's uh, uh, involvement in the arms industry now you may have heard i'm sure many of you have heard of lockheed martin BAE, BAE Systems, General Dynamics, Raytheon, all of these arms manufacturers. But you may not have heard of AVIC, Aviation Industry Corporation of China, which is the sixth major aerospace supplier in the world. You may not have heard of Norinco, the China North Industry Corporation, which is the number one, the top supplier of land systems in the world. 
uh, for uh, uh, in, in general, compared even with, their, with, with its Western counterparts. Or the China Electronics Technology Group Corporation, a major player in electronics uh, applied to military systems. Or the China Chip Building Industry Group. And these are major players that are now starting to get a lot of attention among observers such as ourselves, such as the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute and, and others that are, are, are very curious about the extent of China's involvement in, in the arms trade. So in this context, it is in this, this context that China announced last year that it was to join the arms trade treaty. And a lot of us who follow the arms trade treaty closely were like, wait a minute, China is joining the arms trade treaty? This is odd. Do we even welcome this development? And the tradition at the Control Arms Coalition, which again I'm part of, you know, was every single announcement of a new entrant to the regime was met with a welcome. You know, we, we this is good, this is good, more players to the regime. But when it came to China, there was some discussion. Do we even welcome China or do we just acknowledge uh, acknowledge the fact that China is, is joining the Arms Trade Treaty? So, so there were a series of, of debates, internal de debates, and at the end we came to the conclusion, yes, we are going to welcome China. Because we came to the conclusion that many of the arguments or, 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 or reservations, apprehension around China joining the Arms Trade Treaty, in fact, did not apply only to China, but it applied to many of the other arms exporters. And China was, in fact, not that different from any arms exporters. You know, to name just a couple of initial sort of knee-jerk reactions were, were like, wait, is China trying to simply legitimize irresponsible arms transfers and by wearing that badge of a state party to the Arms Trade Treaty? And the answer, you know, it, it, to, to simplify was, it may be doing so, but it is not alone. Many other, even Western manufacturers are trying to legitimize what we consider to be irresponsible arms transfers, but also play this, uh, you know, responsible international actor role by joining the arms trade treaty. Another reaction was, but you know what? Arms, uh, uh, Chinese exports of arms and ammunition, conventional weapons, are actually found in several conflict zones around the world where civilians are being killed and maimed and infrastructure is being uh, destroyed. But then the conclusion was, actually, that may be true, but ammunition and exports of conventional weapons from other Western um, arms manufacturers are also, are also routinely being found in many of the hottest armed conflict zones today around the world. So some of the reactions re revolved about not, not trying to build an, a, a, an equivalence between China and the others, but really having a cold look and, 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 and a realistic look at, at, at what may happen going forward. So some of the readings were, one, is China trying to upstage the United States? As it happens, China's announcement to join the Arms Trade Treaty came one year after the Trump administration announced that it would unsign the Arms Trade Treaty. So literally as the US left the Arms Trade Treaty, China you know, quickly started to fill that void. We had already in the past two to three years, we had seen it in, at, at Arms Trade Treaty conferences in, in Geneva, in, in, in Japan and, and elsewhere, we had seen, hey, there seem to be more Chinese observers now attending side events, attending the very sessions, is this going to lead to, to something? And indeed, then came the, the announcement that China was going to, to, to join the arms trade treaty. Another reaction has been that we, this can be a positive thing in as much as, as, as China's engagement through the arms trade treaty could be leveraged to try them to join other international regime, treaty regimes and, and, you know, become an active part of multilateralism in the international community. And, and this is not based on a naive understanding or a crude understanding of what, what China's intentions may be, but really a, a more of a, of a gradual in, increment sort of, sort of a view whereby China can be, you know, little by little, even if it's going to continue with the responsible and, and arms transfers, et cetera, be, you know, can be brought into the fold of the international multilateralism. Yet another re reading is what's going to happen, what, if, what about China as a funder, you know, for civil society or for other states, you know, to, to help implement the arms trade treaty, to help the work of civil society? Would you take money from China? This was a very uh, direct question that was asked of various partners of ours domestically and internationally, and people were like, no, you know, we'll be lynched so in, on social media at the very least for taking money from China. But then others say, yeah, well, you're taking money from, I don't know, the UK government, which, which uh, um, there's no question that it has contributed to the Yemen conflict, for example, and uh, whose weapons are, 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 are found in, in other conflict zones, or, or even Canadian weapons, or US weapons, or French weapons. And, and these are funders, and these are seen to be legitimate funders for, for civil society efforts. So the question was raised, what would be so different uh, around China?
So, I mean, to, to wrap it up a bit and, and, and hopefully to leave a, a, a bit of time for, for, for questions and answers, I think that it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. You know, it's, it's, there are, you know, are there ulterior motives? Of course, you know, there may be something to, to, to try to legitimize practices that are not, that we would not like. But also, realistically, in our view, it is not that different from practices of, 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 of other Western our manufacturers around which, you know, the, the very difficult questions remains about the real commitment to the arms trade treaty, to the provisions, to the spirit, to the obligations of a multilateral regime that will, that will regulate the, the, the trade in conventional weapons. When we were pushing for the arms trade treaty, I recall, and the arms trade treaty, by the way, is a relatively new treaty. It's, it's, it's six years old this December. It, it, was, it came into force in, on Christmas Eve, 24 December of 2014. Uh, when we were pushing for it, because, before it came into force, it was part, of, part slogan, part reality. I mean, one of the lines we used was that the, 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 the global trade in bananas had more stringent regulations on the global trade in conventional weapons. You know, country of origin, size, shape, whereas the trade in conventional weapons seemed to be a free-for-all, you know? And, and, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but we did use that slogan and there was some truth to it. So the, the assumption is that these multilateral mechanisms to better regulate the, the, the trade in conventional weapons must entail a change to the business as usual attitude, whether it's China, whether it's Western arms, arms manufacturers. And the reality is that we haven't seen a profound change to that business as usual attitude. Even when joining the arms trade treaty, the states benefit politically by saying, look at us, we're an international actor, we have joined this, the arms trade treaty, uh, but the practices haven't changed substantially. So with China, it's, it's too soon to tell we hope that something comes 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 out of this, and uh, and that uh, and that it can be you know it can be again used as leverage for bringing China into the fold of multilateralism. Hopefully, some some tangential benefits come can come out of this. In the meantime, we expect that China will continue supplying weapons, primarily to the developing world. So, who is China selling weapons to? China is selling to, you know, their, their main exports go, are, stay close to home in Asia. So lots of Chinese weapons are going to Pakistan, countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia. Uh, in Africa, also, the, as it gains a stronger foothold in Africa, we're seeing Chinese weapons going to Egypt, Morocco, Tanzania, South Sudan, and Sudan. And in the Americas, I guess, closer to us, closer to home, the top, uh, the top uh, destination of Chinese uh, weapons is Venezuela, perhaps not surprisingly, followed by Bolivia. So, so again, on the whole, and not, and, and, and I want to emphasize that uh, not born out of naivete or, 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 or not knowing what the, what the, you know, what the, the political impact and are very well thought out, you know, for, by the Chinese government, perhaps. On the whole, we feel that it is better to have them in the, inside the arms trade treaty regime than outside and that some potential benefits can come out of this. But um, it's, a, it's only two months old that Canada, that China has joined the arms trade treaty. So it, much of this remains to be seen. So I'll leave it here and I'm happy to, to address any questions that may arise. Thank you. Great, Cesar. Thanks to all the panelists for staying within their time and for presenting really great presentations that, that provide a lot of food for thought. Uh, we've got a variety of questions from the audience. Uh, one of them, uh, I'll, I'll sort of twist around, but the question was about U.S. hegemony. And I'm, what I'm curious about is not so much whether U.S. hegemony is over, but it it's really hard over the past four years to disentangle um, the reduction of American power in the world and the rise of Chinese power from the world from the Trump experience. And so I guess the, the first question I have for everybody is uh, the Biden team is going to hit the ground running. They have a lot of people from the past administrations. Um, should we expect uh, that the Americans are going to, put us in less awkward places than in the past four years, or is it going to be even more awkward because they're expecting more from now we're actually going to be trying to cooperate as opposed to just trying to duck and cover? Maybe that's for Roland first, and then, then Don, and then Cesar. Um, a bit of both. I, I think it's going to depend on the issue. Uh, you know, like the 
the uh, assuming that the Democrats don't win the two seats in Georgia, you're going to have a Republican controlled Senate. And that's going to place significant constraints on what Biden can do. Now, in foreign policy, he has a fair amount of flexibility, all presidents do. But even within foreign policy, there are certain issues where he has more or less. Like on trade policy, he might not have very much flexibility. Uh, a, some people have talked about, you know, the United States re-engaging uh, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. In fact, uh, Tony Blinken had mentioned, you know, that, that he thought it was a great strategic mistake for the Trump administration to have withdrawn from that agreement because it was a way of establishing norms and kind of defending against the encroachment of a Chinese-based uh, set of set of norms and rules. So he's implied that he thought that, you know, the United States should be part of that. But I think that that's going to be a really tough sell, not just to uh, to Congress, uh, both parties in Congress, but also to the progressive side of the Democratic Party that uh, that Biden needs to be uh, balancing uh, in his own uh, coalition. So on some issues, there there will be, you know, less flexibility. And so, you know, to the extent that the United States and, and the Biden administration pursue policies that allies consider to be protectionist, like a Buy America on steroids, then that has the potential to actually spill over in tensions that could make it more difficult to cooperate in other areas, like establishing common standards uh, in relation to China, for example. Having said all that, I mean, the, the 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 Biden does have a pretty traditional uh, view of American foreign policy. Uh, he talks when he talks about China, he talks about upholding rules. He doesn't talk in in Trump's terms about bending China to America's will. He's talking about establishing and upholding and strengthening rules, and he's talking about working with allies to do that. And within that framework, we can expect a much more you know uh, positive relationship with the United States. And for Canada in particular, we can hope for a, a, a significant repairing of relations between the United States and some of our closest allies. And as, as I said before, that's very much uh, in Canada's interest. Thank you, Roland. Don? So I, I agree with much of, of what Roland just said. I, I think there's two parts of this for me. Well, one is that I anticipate, although it's it's way too early to, to know for sure, but I anticipate there will be more of a multilateral approach um, with the Biden administration. And I do think there will potentially be a more nuanced um, leveraging of various instruments of power and, and techniques in, in how we approach these issues. Um, th that said, over the last several years, I think the U.S. has changed and China has changed in ways that have fundamentally shifted the dynamics of the relationship. So we're not we're not in the same world that we were during the the last Obama administration, and so as a result of that, not only was there a focus by the by President Trump on great power competition in the national security strategy, national defense strategy, but increasingly within Congress and various aspects of society, as you know, Roland mentioned earlier, even public opinion, you know, and we can debate how what caused some of those shifts, because part of it is internal domestic politics within the US, part of it was China's actual behavior. But on issues such as Xinjiang and Hong Kong, and even you know, I see a question in the, the sidebar on the two Michaels and, and China's behavior has been deeply disturbing to many Democrats and to many in Congress in almost every sphere of our, our relations. So I do think we may move away from some of this new Cold War type of rhetoric or framing. So if you think back to the um, Pompeo speech that occurred in July at the Nixon Library, there's very much a, a framing of you know, this in those terms. So I think we may see a shift away from that and from some of the narrative, but I think that the fundamental concerns regarding China's role in the world, 
China's governance system, China's approach towards human rights, its increasingly assertive behavior, I think all of that is still there. And so I, this is one area where I expect to see change in our approach, but I expect to see it more on the margins. But again, you guys have brought up some excellent examples. For example, with the TPP, you know, that's something that obviously the TPP continued without the U.S. And as I mentioned in my presentation, the RCEP was recently signed. And, you know, so perhaps we do move back towards wanting to engage more in a TPP-like entity that would make a lot of sense. Uh, if the, the focus is going to be more on multilateralism and institutions and approaching this by emphasizing U.S. values on human rights and on freedom, um, in addition to some of the more unilateral actions that we've taken over the last several years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Cesar. Yes, I mean, it's a great question. I would agree with both uh, with both Roland and, and, and Don. I mean, a couple of, of things. I mean, even in the context of great power competition, I think we cannot lose sight of the, of the notion of mutual interest. I, I think that the Chinese, including the Xi government, can be very pragmatic. And uh, for all its ills and for all the, you know, the human rights concerns, et cetera, there is such a thing as mutual interest. I think in the Biden administration, with all the, the congressional constraints that it may have because of Republicans, et cetera, it can set the tone. It seems, it may seem, you know, wishy washy, but the tone is very important with which it approaches, it approaches China. The going it alone part, I think, applies not just to middle powers who can't outmuscle uh, China, but also to the United States. I think the Biden administration will, will see it to, to its benefit not to go it alone and to seek, you know, multilateral, a multilateral approach, even if it is, you know, strong or stronger than the middle powers. There is still some benefit to, to, to building alliances and to having a common position. And and lastly, China, uh, to paraphrase Roland from, from his initial remarks, China will become the enemy we turn it into, or the West turns it into. And Australia can, may have some reflections in that regard, in terms of, okay, if you push China into the corner, they will, you know, they will feel cornered and, and, and push back hard. So I think, it, you know, it's, it's a very delicate balance, but I think the Biden administration can, at the very least, can set a very different tone than we have heard from, from, from his immediate predecessor. Uh, staying with you, Cesar, uh, one question from the audience was that in managing the, the post-COVID recovery, there will be a battle of soft power that, uh, for instance, the Chinese have been offering help, although a lot of that help on COVID had um, strings attached to it. Uh, and, and so we're going to see them try to spread their vaccine to get, get some, you know, as, as both a good thing to do and a thing to get uh, leverage in the world or, or a better image in the world. And me, Canada has bought up more vaccines than it could possibly use if all of the vaccine lines come to fruition. And so Canada and the other Western countries can also be uh, trying to win the battle of hearts and minds in the world. And I'm curious from your perspective, when you've seen the Chinese at these arms trade, uh, trade treaty conferences, um, what, how countries react to them because they see, on the one hand, China saying the right things. On the other hand, China has removed the gloves from its velvet, you know, the velvet glove from its iron fist over the past five years, as, as Roland detailed quite nicely, um, not just to Canada, but to pretty much everybody. So I'm curious as to whether country, whether Chinese soft power leading in the conferences that you've, you've participated in uh, as someone who's been able to see this up close. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think there's an element of calculation, and I, 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 even in the COVID uh, realm and health, you know, diplomacy, we can't see it as pure altruism. I mean, this is not to say that it is not to be welcomed, and this is, you know, sorely needed, especially in developing countries. But uh, but there's an element of calculation and, and of winning hearts and minds, etc. I think the, the the reaction from the international community varies. You know, you're the the classic West, you know, Western Europe, North America, etc., sees the, this, these Chinese efforts with a lot more reticence. But you be surprised, you know, in Africa and in smaller Asian countries, they actually welcome even the political model. They are, you know, if you're an up-and-coming leader in, in, in an African country, you know, the, the message now, especially with the Trump administration, global tobacco meltdown, however you call it, you know, it may seem appealing, you know, the, 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 and the Chinese may have this rhetoric, look at us, you know, we've strong-handed but orderly and look at this public reality show meltdown, you know, and it may, this, this Chinese model, including, you know, sold through its soft power initiative, et cetera, may start to gain, to gain adepts in, 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 in some parts of the world for sure. Thank you.
Don, to follow up on this, I guess the question I, I, I've had for China for the past several years is they've clearly been more belligerent and it's created reactions to this, right? And so has there been any learning that you can see in Chinese behavior where they've learned either A, that increased coerciveness works or that there's a backlash because you're seeing a bunch of different countries respond pretty seriously. The US, both you and Roland cited a variety of examples. And I think if you take a look at the various polls that have been done around the world, uh, China's image is not looking that good, even in, in when they had a free ride when Trump was trumping around the world. Uh, China was not winning that many hearts and minds, and at least in the surveys. And if you take a look at, at, at uh, Canadian surveys of uh, public opinion about China, they're not very favorable. And so I guess the question is, do the Chinese think that this coerciveness is sustainable and won't produce a, the backlash that's producing is something that they can weather? Or is it that there's a domestic political fight where there are more points to be scored by appearing to be strong, even if it antagonizes the planet? And so first, I should say that the public opinion polling, there has been quite a bit of um, diversity in the results of that, you know, whether you're looking at the West versus the developing world over a period of time. And I'd be curious to see Pew come out with some new numbers, because the most recent one with the 14 countries, it's very much Europe and um, Japan, you know, etc. Um, but that said, it's interesting to think about, because on one hand, when China is behaving in this way because a country has touched on what it considers to be its core interests. Um, I don't know how, there may be some learning, but I think there's less receptiveness on the Chinese side to back down. So for the, the reason I bring up this example is, for example, in many countries in Africa where you're having a pushback on debt diplomacy, I do think China is trying to address some of that. They, they don't want to be perceived in that way. They, they don't want to be seen as a neo-colonial or neo-imperial power. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't their intent, although that may be some of the byproducts. So I think they attempt to address that and to change the narrative on it. But when you're dealing with Australia, that it appears the current action by China is because it's displeased in the stance that Australia is taking on the South China Sea, that it's calling for an investigation regarding COVID, that it's, you know, really touching on these issues. I don't see it backing down. I see it doubling down. Same mm -hmm. thing. I think a lot of China scholars were shocked at the time, although increasingly are, are less surprised by this behavior. But when the two Michaels were taken, I think that really shattered some of the norms. Um, although many of us, I think, understood that, okay, they're trying to retaliate and they're trying to demonstrate to um, countries around the world that if you cooperate with the U.S. or if you touch on China's you know, interests in that way, there will be a punishment. But mm -hmm. the fact, when the two Michaels were taken, I mean, I expected they might be you know, kept for a few weeks or, you know, something like that to, to prove a point. The yeah. fact that we're sitting here today and they are still being held, you know, is shocking um, oh. over that issue to me personally. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, is China learning from that? Um, obviously, there's been backlash in, in Canada and there's been backlash. You know, you look at the public opinion polling that Roland brought up. There's a lot of negative views of China right now, not just because of COVID, but because of all, all these issues. So I think on one hand, they're becoming more confident and are more willing to use those. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe they're gonna become more nuanced in it, but I think it really depends on the issue on why they're getting the backlash. But if it touches on something they consider core, mm -hmm. especially like Taiwan, for example, that's something that I don't think they're gonna back down. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did have an experience last, no, oh, I guess it was two years ago now. The, the, the Michaels had been in, in, uh, held for ba basically two years, and I was I had two Chi members of the Chinese embassy in my office, uh, and we were talking about these issues, and they're saying, "How can we improve Canadian relations with Canada?" And I said, "Well, release the two Michaels." And they were like, "Besides that," and I was, and, and 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 I'm like, "There's no besides that," and it wasn't. I don't think they quite got that 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 was such a breach of norms, and was so antagonizing to the Canadian public. And they, they're yeah. like, we, we, we take people prisoner all the time. Why should you be bothered by this? And it's like, this is really important. Um, yeah. and, and I think on the Uyghurs, a similar, I mean, obviously different issue, but but similar in that that disconnect of obviously most of the Western world is deeply disturbed by mm -hmm. what's happening in Xinjiang. And mm -hmm. you haven't, you've seen a modification in the narrative and you've seen them package it up differently and communicate it to their own public differently, but the behavior just continues to worsen over years.
And Roland, that, uh, that, uh, somebody just asked a question that, that directly addresses that, which is how can we cooperate with a country that's, that has the world's largest concentration camps? Uh, that the, the, what is doing to its people are, are so beyond the pale, uh, how they're crushing their minorities. Um, how, do you, how do you cooperate when a regi regime is being that repressive? Yeah, and it's it's a really difficult question and a different difficult problem, you know. Um, and it it depends on the circumstances. I mean, we cooperate with a number of countries that we disagree with on a, in in different areas, and we cooperate in areas where we have a mutual interest to cooperate. And and sometimes our uh, we are so appalled by what those countries are doing that it really limits the possibility for cooperation because we don't want to have extensive cooperation. So you and you can take any number of cases like as Turkey, for example, has become more repressive and authoritarian. You've seen a shift in the in the scope of cooperation with Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of discussion, as Cesar knows very well, about Canada's cooperation with Saudi Arabia, another repressive regime. We trade with Saudi Arabia, but maybe the line there should be, we're not gonna sell Saudi Arabia lethal uh, equipment. Uh, so we draw the lines in different places. And, uh, you know, China is Canada's, uh, second or third largest trading partner, depending on how you measure it. So there's a question. I mean, how extensive our trade relations should be. I think that the that the uh, that that we are both appalled and aware that we have uh, some areas of common interest. And the difficulty, the challenge, the complexity of foreign policy is to be able to manage that that kind of push and pull in bilateral relationships and to be doing that simultaneously in a kind of three-dimensional chess in your relations with other countries and within international organizations. I'm not sure where that line is going to end up with China. I think that, you know, one of the questions that I saw pop up was related to Hong Kong and the Chinese actions in Hong Kong, uh, which followed, you know, the detention of the two Michaels and a number of other actions have changed perceptions of China in really significant ways. And that, I think, really begins to restrict the scope uh, for the, the appetite will for cooperation with China. What how the uh, the you know the situation regarding the Uyghurs in Western China, which seems to be involve crimes against humanity of one kind or another, how that um, it clarifies itself will be important. You know, I, I would note that Bob Ray, our ambassador to the UN, has called along with other people called on the UN to 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 investigate the possibility of genocide taking place in that area. And, and I think that we just, you know, it's a very fast moving situation in the sense that attitudes and understandings of China, not just in this country, in the United States, in Europe, in the region, are changing very quickly. It's extremely fluid. And, uh, and, and we have to just be, be uh, able to adjust quickly. But I guess I come back to my very first point, which is that um, the Canada needs to be operating with, with allies in this area, with partners, um, and, and has become more successful, I think, in the last couple of years of actually joining partners in making strong statements, whether it's about Hong Kong or other controversial issues and their safety in numbers. So we can both be driving those kind of uh, collective actions um, and benefiting from them as well. Thanks, Roland. I, I guess for a, a quick yes or no answer, Roland, should Krista Freeland uh, do what she did with the United States and become a single issue person and be completely work focused on China to the exclusion of all others? Uh, well, she's or, the, she is the uh, finance minister now, so that would take away from a pretty important job she has here at home, but I guess, I mean, what you, um, I think what, what I take from your question is, um, you know, the part of what we need to be doing, there's things, things that we need to be doing at home anyway, mm -hmm. in regard to China, we need to, you know, strengthen our regime for reviewing uh, foreign investment, especially state-owned enterprises. You know, we need to be, uh, be preparing for geopolitical competition in the Arctic. But we also need to be investing in the resources that we're going to need 
in order to manage in a world where Asia is increasingly the center of economic growth and the center of strategic rivalry and competition. And that means, it means investing in, in, in long, the long-term investments in our defense capabilities, but it also means reinvesting in our, in our diplomatic capabilities, especially expertise on China, which yeah. is not an area of great strength, or at least that we don't have enough um, of people of enough experts on China within our government apparatus as it currently stands. Yeah, I, I do think that one of the consistencies that we've seen in Canadian foreign policy is that things are much more straightforward and we perform much better when we send our you know prime minister to Europe than to Asia. Uh, we haven't had any controversies in, in Trudeau visits to Asia because there haven't been any lately. <laughs> uh, and so one of the, the challenges of the future is how do we do that better? And I think in the American case, the fact that, that uh, Biden picked Blinken, who has much more Asia experience than, let's say, a Susan Rice, was a signal of prior priorities that, uh, that one of the problems that Obama got into was, you know, his discussion of the pivot to Asia was, was, was well intended. It felt the Europeans felt slighted by it, but it, the basic idea was you guys got this, you guys we can cooperate without without as much wattage, much attention, much intellectual uh, effort, as much uh, resources. But China is really hard, particularly since our you know one of the things that was hinted at in some of the discussions is our two principal allies in the region, Japan and South Korea. Their relations have not been good lately. They've never been good, but they've been worse the past several years. And and I think that partly has to do with Trump foreign policy, uh, uh, letting uh, the North Koreans divide Japan and South Korea. But uh, it's not just about that. It, uh, that relationship is hard in the best of times. Um, so we're running out of time. So I, I guess I want to go through the panel and, and starting with Caesar and then Don and then Roland. Just a, a last, what is the one thing that you would say to policymakers about what kind of should be either prioritizing, avoiding, the big mistake to avoid, the, the one piece of leverage that we have against this incredible, incredibly strong uh, country that has asymmetric interests with us? Uh, so Cesar, what is the one thing that you would say? Yes, thank you. I mean, I would say consistency. I mean, China is is, is keenly aware of the way it is perceived, uh, and it is keenly aware of the reticence and apprehension that it that it that it uh, drives, you know, in, in many countries. But it can always play the lack of consistency card. I'm glad Roland mentioned Saudi Arabia. You know, if 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 the, if the you know if the measure is human rights, then they can say, well, well, why are you so cozy with Saudi Arabia? If the measure is is oppressed people, what about Palestine? You're cozy with Israel. You know, all of these things, and, and so. So, so I think a measure of consistency will go a long way to have a more firm uh, uh, approach to China and say, listen, we do, we neither condone nor encourage bad behavior with you or anybody. Fantastic. Uh, Don. I think as we discussed before, there's the potential for more of a focus from a U.S. perspective on cooperation, although continuing competition as well. And I think Canadians, um, from a policymaking standpoint and government standpoint, have a lot to contribute to that as an ally, whether it be on the environment or nonproliferation or strengthening liberal norms in the system. So I just encourage Canadian policymakers to be obviously reaching out and helping in those efforts, because I think that, that that's part of what's been missing the last few years is the focus on not just the competition, but the areas where we do have shared interests, both the U.S., Canada, and China, and trying to facilitate some traditional cooperation in those areas um, mm. to provide public goods more broadly. And that would probably be things like climate change and, and a pandemic, I would think more than anything else. Uh, Roland. Uh, I think clarity. And by clarity, I mean clarity uh, in terms of where we're going to draw the line, because we need to communicate that very clearly to Beijing. I don't think that we have communicated that really clearly mm -hmm. to Beijing. And we need that clarity in as the basis for an agreement among uh, our partners and allies about where we will collectively uphold uh, mm -hmm. certain limits. And, and then, you know, implied in that is as, as uh, Don was just mentioning, as we've discussed so far, what, you know, by, by clearly defining what it is that we will not accept and that we will uphold, we're also leaving open the possibility of cooperating in areas where we absolutely need China's cooperation, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, non-proliferation and arms control, including newer kinds of weapons, or the other issues that have been discussed. 
uh, including pandemic preparedness and uh, the stability of the global financial system, that's pretty darn big. And then there's a third area, which is areas where we're not going to cooperate and we're not going to oppose, but we're, in a sense, going to work out rules of the game where we uh, you'd essentially try and agree to disagree. And a lot of the buffers from the Cold War that prevented uh, tensions and incidents from escalating between the United States and the USSR don't really exist in the relationship between the US and China. And when it comes to the South China Sea, East China Sea, et cetera, we need some kind of stable situation where there is a, a, a mutual expectation about what the other is going to do, not do, et cetera. We need stability in that environment. So we're looking for a new detente without having to go through things like the Cuban Missile Crisis to get there. I, I wouldn't call it detente. I would call it coopetition. You know, we, just, <laughs> we have to be we have to be firmer on what we're disagreeing with and clearer about where we're willing to negotiate and compromise. Well, I really compartmentalization. Appreciate... What's that? Compartmentalization a little bit. But yes. Uh, just like we've been managed to get through the, the pandemic by compartmentalizing our own lives, we should compartmentalize the relations with China. Um, it's easy to say it's going to be hard to do when we have parties competing with each other to have various governments be seen as being too too soft on China. Uh, but I really appreciate the three of you taking your time to speak with us today. All the presentations were, were really insightful, and uh, I know that it gives us a, a clear idea of what's ahead of us uh, and the challenges that we face. So again, thank you for your time. For the audience, we're going to step back and, and take a 10-minute break, um, and then we'll come back with uh, the panel on uh, making masks great again, health and security at home and abroad, uh, moderated by Aaron Gibbs and Ron Schott. Um, so we'll see you all in about 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, again, thanks to the panel. Really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I learned a lot, and I think everybody else did. So thank you. Thank you.